الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد so this is a series of lectures. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This began about six weeks ago. It was sad that it began after another shooting took place, someone in our own community. So this is not the series on the seat of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is actually a different series altogether. This is a series on trying to come up with a comprehensive solution for this problem drugs and gangs and violence and so on and so forth and this is a problem that not just the muslims not just the youth of our communities not just i mean youth from all over the world from different countries and different different parts of the world they are unfortunately involved with drugs is a problem that many people are in, involved with and gangs and violence and guns is something it's a very big problem and so, of course, we're not going to be able to come up with the solution to this problem ourselves. And this isn't something we will come up, the solution, will come up with the solution to this problem over just discussions. But this is something that, of course, requires tremendous discussion. We will begin, we have begun. This is the sixth Saturday now where we have this discussion. We began by discussing. And it wasn't a lecture. It isn't just one person speaking, everybody else listening, 30 minutes is up, we all disperse and go home. No, this is more of a very, it's a discussion. Your input, my input, we share our ideas, our suggestions, our concerns, our worries, whatever it is that we can, we can give, we can input to try to bring about some form, some type of solution to this problem because it's a very big problem and unfortunately, sadly, tragically, we've lost lives of many young Muslims, some of whom at one point in time were connected to the masjid, some of whom had memorized the entire Quran from cover to cover, some of whom were attached to scholars, but it's sad. Whatever reasons we've discussed, Jazakallah khairan, we've discussed some of these in the past, in the previous episodes as well. Last week, we began discussing how, which method parents are to adopt when addressing their children. And this doesn't only apply to parents. I made this mention, I made this uh, point last week as well. This applies to every single one of us. We may have brothers, sisters, we may have children, we may have friends. Sometimes we don't know how to address them. And in trying to bring about benefit, unfortunately, we make a harm. It's a bigger harm than there is a benefit when trying to tackle the issue. The intention of the one that was addressing, the one that was speaking, the one that was concerned may have been a pure intention, but the manner in which he addressed the issue was not the best. Therefore, the person that he was trying to address, the one that he thought might just need some guidance, some help, some mentoring, they're sometimes driven even further away. So there are many things that we mention in terms of communication. We said that communication is the foundation. Many people's hearts have been won by friends, by parents, by brothers and sisters, simply because they use the right form of communication. If we know how to address the issue, and if we think we have what it takes to address the issue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring about enormous change. Though change isn't in our hands, hidayat isn't in our hands, guidance isn't in our hands, it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But whatever is possible in our means. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for Abu Jahl, one of his arch enemies, one of his sworn enemies. But the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. There's nobody in the world today that is as bad, as evil as Abu Jahl, period. The Prophet ﷺ said he is the Fir'aun of this Ummah. But the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. And he made dua for Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was also a very big enemy of Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahabbi hadayn hadayn al-rajulayn ilayk. Which, whichever one of these two is more beloved to you, O oh Allah, bless and honor Islam through them. The Prophet ﷺ made dua. 
He made dua for the Islam of Abu Jahl or Umar ibn Khattab. The Prophet ﷺ is making this dua and Allah revealed to him that Abu Jahl is not going to become Muslim. Cut him off the list. He said, okay. He didn't... Abu Jahl isn't going to accept Islam. He didn't say anything. Allah didn't say anything about Umar. So the Prophet ﷺ continued to make dua. Allahumma ayyid al-Islam bi Umar ibn al-Khattab. Oh Allah, bless and honor Islam through Umar ibn al-Khattab. And then we know, long story short, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu became a Muslim. So we have to try regardless. Hidayat, not in our hands. Change, not in our hands. Guiding somebody, not in our hands. But to make an effort is in our hands. And this is exactly why we began this discussion. This is something that should have been spoken about. And it's being spoken about in different spectrums and in different realms and different ways but this is something we need to address as well every single one of us is responsible every single not just the maulana not just the scholar not just the uh first uh responder not just the psycho or the psychic rehab specialist no every single one of maybe you might speak to one person and bring about a change in his or her life we don't know so nevertheless the next point that we wanted to make in regards to communication is listening many people like to talk we want somebody to to change their ways so we just talk and talk and talk and this might not be the solution sometimes a lot of these people that we find on the streets unfortunately that are away from their homes let alone the masajid the men folk a lot of them never had anybody to listen to them their parents didn't listen to them their siblings they probably didn't get along with, they didn't listen to them. Not listen to their orders, their commandments, no. Just listen to them, hear them out. Whatever it is that they wanted to say, whatever it is that they wanted others to hear from them, there was nobody at home to listen to them. There was nobody in the masjid to listen to them. So they had to find somebody. This is natural. It's, it's, it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this human being with. We're social beings. We want to talk. We want somebody to listen to us as well. But because they don't have anybody to listen to them, they have to find someone. And that someone that they find sometimes is not the right person. And the impact and the negative influence of that person then begins slowly to rub off on this individual who needed somebody just to listen to them. And with that, they make these friends outside of the masjid, outside of the home. And many parents don't even have a clue who our child chooses to befriend. They don't even know. And they're in complete denial thinking that their children are angels. They have no clue what the influence and the impact of these children that my child befriends is going to be how detrimental it's going to be to this person's iman, to this person's health, to this person's physical, mental, in so many aspects, financial being. They, they just deny. Nevertheless, we need to listen. We need to listen, not just once the time is made and all of the other points that were mentioned last week, it's the right time, we're focused, our emotions are in control, we've taken all of these steps and everything isn't in, taken into consideration. Now we need to listen. Whatever it is that they want to say, they're more happy bringing the issue to us than they are listening to us bringing the issue to them. When a person can confide in you, you've won this person's heart. If this person begins to confess about themselves to you, you've won this person's heart. The process to helping heal or cure this person has already begun. Once this person is already sitting with us, they've taken out their time, we've taken out their time, we're listening to them, and with all of this, they begin to talk to us, they begin to confide in us, they begin to share their deepest, darkest secrets with us. We are on the right path. We are doing the right thing. We be, we've, inshallah, we are working towards helping this person heal, towards rehab for this person. Rasulullah would listen 
anybody that had any problem, they came to them and they knew that they could confine in the Prophet ﷺ. They knew they have a disease, they have a problem, there is a sin that bothers them. They could come to Rasulullah ﷺ and speak to him about it without being judged. A very important point. They'll trust us knowing and hoping that whatever it is that I tell this person will strictly stay between me and him or her. If they tell us something, Rasulullah ﷺ is mentioned, al mustasharu Mu'taman, the one who is confided in, the one whose counsel is sought, the one who wants, who is asked rather, who is asked to, to, to listen. Somebody wants to talk to them, this person, who people come to confide in, it may be you, it may be a father, a mother, it may be a brother, a sister, it may... this person is trusted. When a person looks like this and like this, they look back. This shows, this is a sign. The hadith of Rasulullah us, tells us, this is a sign that this person wants to keep this discussion a secret. He doesn't want whatever is discussed here to leak out to anybody else. If a father, a son wants to confide in his father, this father doesn't need to tell anybody else in the world. If a friend comes to you to talk to you about his or her problems, nobody in the world should have to be made to know about that discussion that took place between me and so and so. And when this happens, this person's trust is lost in us, there goes the process. This person won't confide in us anymore. Whatever it is that we tell him or her to try to benefit them, they, it won't hold any weight anymore, simply because of the trust issue. So we listen and we, take in, we, we, we make note that whatever is mentioned will be kept a secret. If they've begun to open up to us, this is excellent. Let us not ruin or lose this opportunity by taking whatever we heard here and sharing it with somebody else. These are prophetic teachings as well. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught. And this is how he helped heal and treat and cure the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They trusted him more than anybody else. They trusted him more than they trusted themselves. They knew that the Prophet ﷺ, a secret with him would always be kept a secret regardless. And they learned this from him. Anas was shared a secret with by the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet shared a secret with him. He came home and his mother asked him, what was it that the Prophet ﷺ told you? He said, I'm sorry mom, I can't share it with you. If there's anybody I would like to share it with you, it would have been you. But I can't, because the Prophet's teachings teach us something else. And this is what we need to learn to do. We learn one thing from one person, and astaghfirullah al azim we go and share it with people. This person came to us seeking help, seeking good counsel, seeking, they wanted some guidance. And we took what this person shared with us, and we shared it with somebody else. We've lost him or her. Next. Observe this person. Whatever it is that this person is saying, don't let it fly over our heads. Don't let it go in through one ear and out the other. Because later on, when we follow up this session with another one, we will find that whatever had already been made mention of in that prior gathering, and it, it wasn't taken in. We didn't let it digest. We didn't stomach it. And now we're bringing up the same issue a second time. It's going to be a problem. I already told you this. How come you don't know this? You weren't listening to me. This, this is what we discussed last week. We had to be there mentally, physically. We have to be there. Our mind has to be there. The time has to be right. If they're busy doing something else, if their phone keeps ringing, there should be no phone in that zone to begin with. It should just be us and the person that we're trying to address all alone. So these things already have to be done before we even begin to communicate. And then after that, we observe, what is it that he or she is telling me? Take very careful note of everything that is being said. This child or this friend can literally be made or broken as a result of this, this session, this discussion that we're having with him. 
Rasulullah in his entire Nubuwa has never broken the heart of anyone that has come to him. He is so careful that even the one who was addressed or the one who was spoken about in his presence, though the person wasn't there, but the speech of that person, speaking about that person was done in the presence of Rasulullah Anything that was said that was negative was immediately crushed and eradicated right there and then. Ka'ab ibn Malik radiallahu anhu couldn't join the battle of Tabuk. The Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba, attendance was taken. They were taking roll call, who participated, who didn't. Because in the battle of Tabuk, it wasn't like any other time. It was a very difficult, trying, testing time for the believers. So roll call is being taken. Ka'ab ibn Malik isn't there. Yes, what happened to Ka'ab ibn Malik? One person made a comment. Oh, this is what happened to him. He got carried away with his wealth. Rasulullah said, no, wait. We don't know anything but good about him. That's what it is. If there's anything bad that we have to say, we don't say it at all. If you have something good to say, you share it. Something that will make somebody smile, you share it. Something that is the truth, you speak. Rasulullah said, The hadith of Bukhari, whoever believes in Allah and in the last day, say something which is good or keep quiet. This is gonna, we're going to speak about this again now. Nevertheless, we continue. And what else we have to do? We have to avoid at all costs saying anything that is negative. Like I just said, Anything. Rasulullah said, Bashiru wala tunafiru. Give glad tidings, encourage people, make them happy, give them hope. Don't let them lose hope. Don't let them become despondent. Parents do this to their kids. They tell them, You're not going to become nothing when you grow up. What do you expect from that child? Yes, he may have made, she may have made a few mistakes in their life. They may have made the wrong decisions in their life. When the one individual, the mother, the father, the two that they relied most on their whole life, and they always will, as long as they live, when that same person that is the go-to for them, that is the person that they, that they, that they, 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 they run to, when that person tells them that you're not going to become anything anyways, look at you. This is negative. This is discouragement. This is not found in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Despite anything, no matter how, how low a person may stoop with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hope was always given. He was the, the fountainhead of mercy to all of mankind. Always encouraging, always making them smile, always keeping them happy, always giving them hope, always telling them their strength always helping them like this. Not the opposite. Always motivate. Don't demotivate people. Don't put them down, especially your child. This is the greatest asset. This is your legacy. The greatest asset for a person is his children, those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed. And here he's putting them down, or she's putting them down, or she's telling them things that will make them lose hope. Things that will make them want to revolt. They'll want to rebel. They'll want to disobey. We make the child like this, and then when we, the child does disobey, when the child does show no affection, no love, no kindness, no respect, then we begin to complain. Always encourage. This is what we find in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, at times things will be said, the argument might get heated, don't let it get to that point. The moment somebody's emotions are no longer in control, you may as well just wrap that gathering up, conclude there and then, and postpone the meeting for another one. Because the moment we lose our temper, we lose our control, control of, our, of our, uh, our, our emotions, that gathering is no longer going to prove so fruitful in which voices are raised. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the treaty of Hudaybiyah, the sixth year after Hijri, the truce is going to be signed. All of the clauses in that truce are in favor of the Quraysh, the Kuffar, the Mushrikeen, and none of them are in favor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agrees. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agrees. Next clause, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agrees. Next clause, they aren't in favor of the Muslims. If anybody leaves the camp of the Muslims, the side of the Muslims, to go join the disbelievers in Mecca, 
they will not be returned to the Muslims. But if anybody leaves the disbelievers to come join the Muslims, they'll have to be returned. Rasulullah agrees. And, and like this, you're not going to be allowed to perform the Umrah this year, you can only return next year. They've come after six years of being kicked out of Mecca. They've left Medina. Rasulullah has seen his vision. They have their sacrificial animals with them to make qurbani. They finally come to a place called Hudaybiyah. They're on their way there. They're told no. This year, access denied. He agrees. You're going to return only next year. He agrees. When you return, you're only going to be allowed for three days and that's it. Rasulullah agrees. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, What? What is this? Aren't we on the haq? And he raised his voice. Ooh. Rasul Sahasim was displeased. He didn't say anything. For the rest of his life, he lost control of his emotions once, Umar ibn al-Khattab on this occasion, before Rasulullah Sahasim. For the rest of his life, he was upset at himself for that one action. If you lose your emotion, leave. It's done. Wait. That's why before we began, last week we discussed this, and I'm just keep repeating these points. We have to make sure we set the stage right. Everybody has to be focused. You have to remain engaged. You're listening attentively. Your mind isn't anybody anywhere else. This is a matter of life and death. A person can, we don't know, change their life, come back to Allah, become a a very great friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the other hand, this person can just leave even further, go for, further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of the psychologists they mention, keep this in mind, it's called calm. See, calm, control your thoughts and actions. Don't, physical, that's far-fetched. That's, out of, that's not, not, to control your even emotionally, be in control. So remain calm, see, Control, control your actions, your words, your thoughts, your, all of this needs to be in control. A, assess and decide if you are too upset to continue. The moment you lost your cool, now you need to assess, you need to gauge, you need to evaluate. If I say anything after this, it's gonna be really, really bad. Last night, I was sitting somewhere and something was said in the, ooh, it was, it was, it was a, a family, I was sitting with a family the, the, the child said something so nasty to the parent, to the mother, in front of me. That's when I'm, I, I don't know what to do after this. You've, what, what do you do? And you're hearing this with your own words. The moment the person that they've come to seek help from loses their cool, or you even, you realize this is where it's headed, stop. It's not mandatory, it's not a must that you have to conclude, that you have to come up with the solution, that you have to finish and you know, find the, the answer to the... No! If this isn't it, you realize, maybe I should stop. Because the moment the anger, control, there's, there's no control over your anger, over, your emo, over, over our emotions, that's when shaitan has come inside the picture. And the moment he comes, now there's words, now there's profanity, now there's obscenity, now there's... And sometimes it gets physical, sometimes it gets so out of hand that to he, it became, again, a bigger harm than it did a benefit. L, leave the situation if you're feeling too angry or upset. Do so. Yes, leave the situation if you have to. Some people consider this, this is the, the answer to their anger. They leave the situation, they just disperse. They get up in the middle of a gathering and they leave. It was better for this person to do so. Had this person continued, had this person stayed, he probably would have said something in anger, or she would have said something in anger that he or she would regret for the rest of his or her life. So it was better for this person to have left. Why not? It's going to look really bad. Oh my God, he got up, he left, she got up, she left. So what? If this is what's going to help this person, his anger subside, her anger leave, then he or she must leave the gathering. So C, control. A, assess. L, leave. And M, make a plan to deal with the situation. Even before we began, our thoughts should have already been in place. We should have known exactly it is how we were going to address this and what it is we were going to say, how we were going to say it. Everything should have already been brainstormed beforehand. 
This is when we're showing my child, my brother, my sister, my friend, my whoever it is that I'm speaking to, that I came prepared and I'm serious about this. This is a very important issue. You and your problem and your issue to me is extremely important. When they see this, they confide in you. When they begin to confide in you again, know that you're already inshallah working towards the right track. We are working towards the right track. Next. With this in mind, we always give them hope and we show, we guide them towards taking steps that'll help them in this process. So it wasn't just a matter of talking and listening. It wasn't just conversation that was taking place. We activate them. We put them, give them an assignment, give them a task. I was speaking to a young boy, maybe 13 years old or something, just a couple of weeks ago. And he was telling me his schedule. I asked him what his schedule is during this pandemic. And he told me his schedule. The kid knew exactly what he was talking about. Half of us go to sleep after Fajr, if that, the worst. Those who stay up the whole night and just before Fajr, when shaitan comes to them and puts them to sleep, there goes fajr. That's the worst. And this is happening rampantly during this pandemic. Stay up the entire night because they wake up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. How do you expect to go to sleep at 11 if you're going to go to sleep, if you're going to wake up at 3? You can't stay, your whole day can't be 7 hours. There's impossible. Very rare. So they wake up at 3 in the afternoon. They go to sleep at 3 in the morning. Fajr comes in at four something, five o'clock, uh, four something, sorry. By that time, just an hour before shaitan comes to them, nam nam alayka laylun tawil. Go ahead, go to sleep. He lulls them to sleep. This is the worst. Salman radiallahu anhu said, after Aisha, people have three, there's three categories of people. Those who go to sleep right away. They don't gain, they don't lose. Good for you. You went to sleep, you're tired, sleep. There's those that spend the night in worship. <laughs> How many of those do we have in this day and age? Allah Ta'ala alone knows. Very special group. And then there's the third, the worst class. They spend the night in vice and dark deeds and in evil, in the disobedience of Allah. And worse than that, is that they spend the night in this manner just before Fajr or after Fajr came in, but they went to sleep without performing Salatul Fajr. And if they wanted to pray Fajr, no, I'm going to wake up. In 45 minutes, you're going to wake up. In one hour, that's when the, the sleep just becomes so deep that it's impossible to wake up at this time. That becomes another problem for our parents. Anyhow, that's a different discussion on its own. But we need to encourage them. We need to try new things. So I was speaking with this kid and he gave me this amazing schedule. And then he said, we play on the game console, Xbox, PS, PS something. He said, we play from, for one hour from 7 o'clock to 8 p.m. I said, you don't play longer than that? He says, no. I said, why? Your mom or dad are going to come and they're going to tell you it's time. He said, no. He said, we ourselves turn off the game con and we time ourselves. He's the oldest. He was like 12 or 13 and then he had a 10 and then he had a 7 and then a 4. Four kids. He said, we make sure that we turn it off before that 8 o'clock happens. Why? Because if we don't, we lose the privilege of playing for the next couple of days. This is how you train someone. That kid himself knows that after this, that's it. I'm not going to go any, not a minute past this because I'm going to lose. Whatever privilege I had of playing is gone. This is what we're expected to do with them. We have to assign them something. We have to make them feel like they're capable of doing something. After we've encouraged them, we tell them, this is what you can do. Why don't you start doing this? Perhaps ask them to start reciting the Holy Quran every day for maybe a few minutes. Ask them to connect with the scholar every week. Call them once. Call a scholar once. You don't have to meet them in person. If you can call them over the phone, that's half of the meeting. But people don't even call anymore. People want, I wanted to meet you in person. If you call me, if I call you, half of the meeting is done in, without, without meeting in person over the phone. Have them connect with somebody that they can relate to, somebody that they can talk to. These are things that are going to help them very, very greatly. And going back to when we address them, when we communicate with them, 
We don't show, show any sarcasm. You're going to become a doctor. Let me see you. You said you're going to get 90s. Let me see your 90s. You show me. You show me. Let me see you. Your father was like this. Your mother was like this. Whoa, you're going to become? Don't do this. Rasulullah wasn't sarcastic. Rasulullah wasn't negative. Rasulullah is always, isn't always with everyone and anybody that's, that he's addressed publicly, secretly, openly, collectively, individually. Rasulullah is always encouraged. Make things easy for people. No matter how hard they may think it's, it is for them to leave that way and to come this way, make them feel like you're going to do it. Allah is going to make it easy for you. Allah is going to help you. You make the resolution. You make the firm intention. Allah Ta'ala will take you through it. It's no problem. It's very easy for Allah. It's very simple for Allah. No matter how big their issue may be, how big the problem may seem to them, always them, make them feel and understand that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that it's going to happen, that Allah will make it happen. When that happened in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Sahaba didn't, it was hard for them. How have you just accepted clauses like this, signed a treaty, a, peace, a, a, a treaty, a, a pact like this, and this is supposed to be good for us. That is when Allah revealed Surah Al-Fatah. Allah revealed the verses of the Surah about victory. After this treaty was signed, Hudaybiyah, Allah revealed, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. This was the opening to the greatest conquest of Mecca. This, it was after this. Allah didn't reveal it after the conquest of Mecca. Allah revealed it after the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Rasulullah made the Sahaba understand. So Allah Ta'ala gives them the glad tidings. Allah gives them the good news. This is what we're expected to do. Unfortunately, I'm saying these things, but it's become so difficult for even parents to be able to encourage their children. Even young children. When I perform Salat with my daughter, you know, SubhanAllah, they're so sensitive. I have small children, eight and four and a half. When you correct them in a certain manner, they're turned off completely. I don't want, can, I, can we pray tomorrow? I, I don't want to, I don't want to, today I can't pray anymore. Just because either I was quickly looking on my phone on the side or I was doing something, you know, trying to hide it while she wasn't looking, she was performing the salah. Performing the salat physically, and I was, was supposed to be watching, paying full attention. I need all of this that I'm saying myself. And then she catches you and then you, you, are, you, you correct her in a manner like, no, uh, uh, subhanahu wa Just a little slight raise in your voice and it's finished. You're correcting them in at tahiyyat at tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa They made a little mistake, finished. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the greatest, the greatest psychologist. Every single human being. Aisha radiallahu anha said the hadith of Sahih Muslim. Amarana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anunzila nasa manazilahum. Rasulullah encouraged us, ordered us, treat people according to their status. Whether it's a child, whether it's an old man, whether it's a chief of Aus or Khazraj, whether it's whoever it is, Rasulullah knew how to address every single one of them perfectly, perfectly. So this is what we need to learn. We need to be very careful with our own children, especially with our children first. We are their, they are our responsibility, they are our assets, our greatest assets. And Allah made them our responsibility. We're, we worry, we're concerned about the plight of other people's children, definitely. But those that we will be held accountable for are our own. Save them from the fire of Jahannam. And those who have already, who are already on the streets, they require much more dua. Much more crying, much more seeking Allah Ta'ala's help, seeking Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness for us, for our weaknesses, for our... Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi went to Ta'if, hoping that the people of Makkah didn't listen, maybe, maybe these people will. Oh my goodness, they set the street urchins on them, they pelted stones, they threw stones, big stones, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi his entire body is bleeding profusely, his sandals are stuck with blood. They're cemented to his feet. He's making dua now. When he finally manages to get some shade, 
Allahumma ashku ilayka du'afa quwwati. Oh Allah, I complain to you about the feebleness, about the weakness of my strength. For other people. What about for my child? Oh Allah, my child doesn't listen. Oh Allah, get rid of it. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. That's not how it works. Not in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We need to understand these things. We need, to, we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to practice these things. And don't ever compare your child to somebody else's or your own child to another one of your children. Don't do that. Look at him. Look at his grades. He's doing so great. He's so... And look at you. Don't do that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do that. And we're lucky we have an example, the most perfect example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولَهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ The best example. He wouldn't do this. So don't do it. Because it's only going to break that broken heart even more. It's going to take them further away. Don't compare them to other people's children. You see his children. You see your, 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 your cousins. My brother's children. You see my sisters. Don't do that. This child is one, is unique. There's nobody in the world, the billions that exist. This is one special child. Take care of him in his own realm, in his or her own, in their own situation. Handle it, tackle it differently. Two more points we continue, uh, we conclude inshallah after that. When the child is slow to learn, help the child. Help, don't rush the child. Oh, come on, no, don't do that. If they can only learn Subhanakallahumma that one day, this is more for the younger children or even the older children. When helping the ch child slowly come back to salat, come back to good habits. If they're not able to reach your so, such a high benchmark that you set, don't tell them, come on, we, we're supposed to be doing that. It's okay. It's okay. Take, it'll take time. Don't push them. Let them take gradually, insha'Allah, they're working towards the right path. Allah Ta'ala will bring them there. And finally, when we're dealing with anyone, you don't tell them, don't remind them about what they've done in the past. They want to leave all of that behind and they want to open up a new chapter in their life. They've dusted their hands. They're looking for the right path. They're looking for counsel. They're looking for guidance. Don't remind them. Don't haunt them of who they were, what they used to do. Don't ever do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding. May Allah make it easy for me, for all of us to practice all of these things, to bring them into our lives and to, to be examples for our children, for our friends, for everyone, like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.